I'm Vicki Beamont, and I'm the Education Chair for the GSCCA. And it is, it's my pleasure to introduce Evan Ginsberg and Helen McMullen. We're going to talk about a topic that I think is probably near and dear to everyone's heart. We've all known of cases where um, people have unexpectedly passed away or unexpectedly been incapacitated, and they've had dogs, and it's turned out to be a really um, big deal getting these animals properly cared for. So they're going to give us some pointers on how this can work for us legally and the steps we can take to make sure they're well cared for. So please, everybody, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. For having us, um, I kind of I approached and twisted for Evan's arm. Not to have to twist very hard <laughs> to talk about this, just because a couple over the last couple of years I've dealt with a couple situations where someone passed away and there wasn't plans for their dogs, and I was not connected to those people anyway other than knowing them, and therefore we got involved in having to um, deal with. The, the dogs and the situations and it got really really messy and really really challenging and I'm pretty sure that the wishes of the people who passed away were not probably in met based on how that stuff so um, we want to talk to you guys about some of the preparation and how to avoid that being a problem for you um, and point out some things many of you may already have plans in place but there are some things that are small that are important to note because they can be significant impactors in how this really turns out. And things that we assume are in place and will take care of things may or may not actually do what we think they're gonna do. Um, there's handouts in the back for you and also a sign-in sheet, but I will throw the slides up. There's space on there you can write on it too if you have notes. And please reserve all your questions for Evan. He's gonna answer every question. <laughs> uh, but if you have a question, you can just raise your hand when it comes up or whatever, we'll kind of freely handle that. So these are kind of the areas of concern I wanted to address being what happens if you become hospitalized or need long-term care? What happens when you pass away? We all know we don't get out of here alive eventually, right? That's how that goes. Who are the people that you want to have care for your pets? Do they know you want them to care for your pets? Um, do they have the resources to provide that care? What resources do you have to provide that care? And then the legal requirements. Um, so the first section is what happens. What if you become hospitalized? Is there someone who can immediately take control of your animals for you? And have you made those arrangements with that person? Have you spoken to them and told them what you need from them? And what, um, what you, how to get into your house, taking care of all just those basic fundamental things of do they have keys to your house? Do they have a way to get care of your dogs? Um, don't think it won't happen to you. We all think, oh, I'm young, or I've been healthy, or it's something I don't really want to worry about now. It's something that everybody who has pets should be thinking yeah. about. Um, you should be aware of what's going on and taking some measures to prevent these problems from arising. It's a bad deal in a situation when there's no one around in town that can solve this problem for you. Um, that basically what happens in most instances is your animals are going to the shelter. And if the animals end up in the shelter, it gets real sticky depending on where you live, how easy those animals are to get out of the shelter. Um, so you want to be careful with that. And to also talking about short-term solutions as well as long-term solutions. And when you pass away, same thing, you have an immediate plan versus a long-term. How many of you know where your dogs are going if something happens to you? Okay. So you kind of have <laughs> Yeah. And I have to tell you, as a financial planner, the volume of people that I have run into, I was sitting in one of my little favorite wine shops not too long ago listening to this woman go on and on about how unhappy she was she was stuck with her mother's dog. I mean, just going on, my mom passed away and I'm stuck with this stupid dog and I can't believe I have to deal with this, mm -hmm. on and on. So you might not want to assume those things and have those plans in place. So. There's a big difference between when you have an issue of hospitalization and when you pass away. Um, but you still need to have the same kind of resources in place for that. So the who, here's where we want to start. We usually know who we want to have take our pets, but have we asked them whether they're willing to do that for us? And if we have, have we actually written something down with them? Have we actually created a contract of something in writing that says they will take those dogs and that you give authority for them to take those dogs? Um, 
And do they want to? Be sure they aren't just doing it as a favor for you. Be sure it's somebody who really wants to do it. And it may be, there's many different ways people do this. Sometimes it's the person who's responsible, the child or whatever, who says, yeah, I'll take them and I'll make sure I find them homes and I'll get that taken care of, but they're not going to keep them, right? Versus if you want that person to keep them. So you need to have made those kind of decisions because if you're just asking them to take them, when you're not here, it then becomes completely up to them what they do with them if you relinquish full control of your dogs to them. So you may want to make sure that they know what you mean by taking over. Um, Short-term hospitalization, obviously, your hope is that they're just taking care of you in your home until you can get back on your feet or whatever the case might be. But if you're in long-term care or if you're in a you know, terminal situation, you need to know that they're going to follow what your wishes are. And so I think it's really important that in whatever agreement you've made with them, you've written down what your wishes are and what your expectations are. Is it lifetime care? Is it just find them homes because I trust that you'll do a good job? Is it what is it? And then where it starts getting really interesting is have you talked to them about um, what you would need, what they need from you in order to do that? Um, sometimes those people don't have the resources. Sometimes your best friends who are the best animal care providers don't have the resources to take on what many of us have in terms of dog volume. Maybe they could take one, but they can't take 10. So what do you do to make that happen? And I'll talk a little bit in a minute about some of the resource potential ways you could find to provide them with those resources if that's what you want to do. But you need to make sure that you do that because people will become very bitter and unhappy about your pet if they take over this cute loving puppy that you had that when you passed away and they think it's amazing and they love it and then it's bored and gets sick and then it needs care and it needs special medication and it does this and it does that and they're now burdened with costs and burdened with challenges from this animal that they got from you. And not that they don't want to provide, but maybe it is a challenge that they can't overcome. Um, and so if you really want these relationships to be good and happy for your dogs forever, it's important that you know what you need to put in place to make that happen as well. Have you gotten their contact information? If they are not your primary person for you, so if it's not your executor, your medical emergency person, you're that, then their contact information needs to go to those people. What happens in a lot of cases is there's a failure to communicate. We were talking last night, Twyla and I were about, what if the will's just sitting in the drawer? Do they know? Do they have a copy of the paper? Do the people who have your will know what it is you actually want to have happen? Um, there's a long-term process in terms of what happens with situations when someone passes away, but there needs to be some sort of documentation. The case I dealt with not too long ago, the, when the individual passed away, his dogs ended up in the shelter, and his kids had to provide documentation as next to kin, and there was no planning in place for what was supposed to happen to the, for those animals, and it went really badly, really quickly. And it was a very unfortunate situation when the law got involved, and the police got involved, and the shelter got involved, all of a sudden, the bills to bail those dogs out of the shelter because they don't just take them for free. No. Um, I got those dogs out in um, less than a week once his kids got there. It took a while to get that sorted out. We still paid over $400 to bail out three dogs and they weren't even there a week. And this is on a somebody passed away measure. This isn't a you know, lost, running loose kind of dog. So it's important to understand there's gonna be some of that. If that person isn't standing there, I have a legal document right here that says I can take these dogs. And do you want your dogs sitting in a shelter in general population while they sort this out? Um, and then do you have a contingency plan? As we get older, the people we're looking at, here's the bottom line, the reality of it is, is as we get older, you need to pick somebody younger than you. I mean, you need to find somebody that you anticipate outliving you. That's just the reality of it. Because if you're picking somebody who your same age, you know, no offense, but we can all roll the dice at 90, right? So you need to have been talking to somebody who's significantly younger than you, who has that potential. And if there's a primary person, oftentimes our first primary person is our spouse or a family member. But then the next thing to look at is, I would have a contingency plan as well. What if it's your children and you guys are in an accident on a trip somewhere and you're all together? Do you have a plan B of someone else who's not that close and attached that would be separate enough that you could have a second provider? I know this stuff isn't fun to think about, but I think it's really, really important. Any questions about this part? Okay. All right. Then the next one are the resources. 
What are you planning to pay for um, when you have expect somebody to take over here? Yeah, I do have a question about the other. Okay. I noticed at the bottom is that co-ownership. Oh yes. Does a co-ownership with names on AKC papers automatically give that co-owner? No. 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 That is one of the problems we <laughs> had in that, that. that. In that situation, we dealt with that was one problem, and I thank you for pointing that out. I skipped it there. I think Evan will talk a little bit more about that, but no, your AKC papers mean nothing. And the shelters and the law and AKC will not stand up and back them if you don't have a written contract. And oh, by the way, that dog's still 50 50 to whoever inherits that person's half. Well, so you now co own with whoever so inherits this. Evan, but a arrangement would have to be made because the co owner may be in, in name only for some reason. Right. You know, like they're not oh, really correct. in yeah. Yeah. yeah, so he'll get into it. So co ownerships okay. are a big deal. I, um, you know, to talk about, yeah, your AKC papers alone. So a lot of people are like, oh, I got the registration, we're all good. I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, so then on here, what are you willing to pay for? You know, are you willing to say, if you take my dogs, I'm going to leave $500 per dog for their care, or am I going to do something? In my, in my financial planning, what I have done is I have somebody who is who is on board to take my dogs. This is a younger single person. And because of that, I said, I'm leaving you a life insurance policy that has this much benefit to it. And if something happens to me, that money goes to you, which would be enough to pay off our house. And in our state, this is our house, we go to you. And you'd be able to take care of my dogs on the money I'm leaving you for the rest of their lives and you'd get our house. I don't care, we don't have any kids. So I'm like, here you go. And she's kind of a kid to us, so that's okay. But that's kind of the plan we make. You can be as creative as you want in how you manage it. But you need to decide what it is you're willing to pay for. Is this a person who's doing it out of the kindness of their heart, or is this somebody who's going to expect some compensation for taking on your dog? And there's nothing wrong with that as long as that's an agreement you're willing to make with them and that you're both on the same page about how it's going to work out. And then how do you fund their care? Um, it is so important that you have money in such a fashion as it's immediately accessible. So they don't have to wait for your entire estate to get resolved and all that stuff to happen before they get any money for care, especially if it's someone who doesn't have the resources to do that. It also needs to be money that doesn't go away regardless of your status. So it needs to be money that's in some type of a policy or some type of an account that is readily available indefinitely. The best situation is if you can make them a beneficiary on something because beneficiaries trump all other things. So companies that have policies for you or whatever, if that person brings a death certificate and it shows that they're gonna get a check. And that's end of story. It's not a wait for probate. <laughs> it's not a have to resolve anything. That trumps all that. So if it's written in as you are the beneficiary and this money goes to so-and-so, that makes it much more immediate than, well, after they resolve my estate and everything, they can sort it out. Um, and it needs to be directly payable to that person. Or if you want a plan, like if the person you're giving it to, you want it to be something that pays over a period of time, like they need $5,000 a year I don't know, to take care of your dogs and you want it to pay out over time. That's up to you, however you choose to set those things up. But you need to make sure that the money is designated to go to that person if you want it to go to them. There's a lot of things in the financial world about beneficiaries and taxes and fun things like that, that if you make it so it goes into another place and then it gets paid out to them, they're going to have to pay taxes on it, it becomes income. Whereas if they're the beneficiary on a life insurance policy or something like that, those things pay tax free. So you want to know what those details are before you, when you're going through your planning. So if you work with a financial planner, I would really encourage you to meet with them and talk to them about what you want to do. Also make sure that all parties know. So again, reiterating, be sure that you've told your executor of your estate, be sure it's in your, your will or trust or the other documents Evan's gonna talk about. Be sure that the people, your kids know, be sure that your neighbor knows, be sure that whatever, because those are the people who can help notify somebody in case of an emergency about how to get in there and get those things taken care of for you without getting in trouble legally with just up and on in your house and helping themselves to your shop, right? And then the how. Um, so people can utilize any kind of financial resources. So today we aren't going to really be able to dive into those a whole lot, but some basic ones that we tend to see people use, right, retirement accounts that they might have, like um, 401ks, different sorts of things like that. Also different varieties of life insurance. There are a million different types of policies out there. 
but again, making sure that if you do something like that, you're getting the type of product that doesn't go away when you pass away. It needs to be something, or that if they don't pay it. So for instance, going back to that long-term care, if someone goes into care and they stop paying their premium, does that policy go away in that interim and nobody's taking care of it and all of a sudden they pass away and you're prepared to get the check and they go, sorry, that policy lapsed, it's history. So it's important to make sure that you're meeting with someone and they're walking you through that. And then there's a variety of other kind of financial products that are out there that you can utilize to um, fund those resources if you would like to. And again, as I said, um, making sure that you've designated your beneficiaries and that their information is readily available and accessible to all the people who need to know. So kind of on that financial end and building that front-loaded piece, are there any other questions I can answer? Okay, so let's... Can I just oh, yeah. add something? Uh, I learned recently that if you have a life insurance policy and your kids or whoever don't know you have that policy, um, the insurance company won't notify them necessarily. Well, they know. But how would the insurance company know? Absolutely. In the financial industry, you wouldn't believe how many millions of dollars there are sitting out there in unclaimed policies. So please be sure you tell people. That's what I was saying about notify them that this is what it is and this is the company where it is and this is who you need to call. Because, yeah, they wouldn't know you passed away. Those companies wouldn't know that. keep your money. Yeah, and yeah. the money just sits there and waits. And if somebody finally shows up and asks for it, I actually just dealt with the case last year of some kids who came by and said, we finally were going through some stuff with my mom's and we found these other accounts that she has with you. I'm like, yeah. Well, she passed away two and a half years ago. Fine. Here's the checks. Off you go. You guys went two and a half years without a big chunk of money. But okay, <laughs> here you go. Right? So, yeah, be sure that you are... Yeah, it's, I think the biggest thing is making sure that you're communicating with all the parties involved and that everybody who might possibly need to know knows not only who, but what and where, those kinds of things. Because it becomes a big deal if they don't know where to go and find it. And most of the companies only require a death certificate. So you need to make sure that the person, because usually the executor gets those, and then they pass them to the companies that need them. And if the executor doesn't know, or the beneficiary of the, the, your caretaker doesn't know that the executor has handled it, it can get really messy because there's a lot of stuff. Lots of people have different things going on. So anything else on that piece that I can tell you about? OK, well, I'm going to turn it over to Evan. And then if you guys have questions that it comes along, we'll answer them. Thank you. I think everyone here knows who I am, but if you don't, I'm an attorney. I used to be a certified life underwriter selling life insurance. Uh, I'm also a professional magician. <laughs> yes. My whole family uh, are professional magicians. I want to tell you something. My aunt just died at 104. And I want to tell you something about living and dying and, and so forth. And I asked her, what do you do? What did you do to live to be this old? And she told me something. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to do it. And if you do it, I absolutely promise you, you'll live to be over 100. <laughs> and I said to her, what do you attribute to being this old? And she looked me in the eye and she said, I didn't die. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to tell you a story about a woman that wanted to take her dog to Israel. And so she called the airlines and she said, what do I do to take my dog to Israel? And they said, well, you buy a crate. You put your dog in the crate. You Get on the plane with your dog, and when you get to Israel, your dog will be waiting in baggage, and you get your dog. So she did that. When she got there, they couldn't find her dog. And the freight handlers are going crazy, and they're down in the basement. They find the dog. It's dead. So the, the, the chief said, just go down to the pet shop. It's just a standard poodle. They're all alike. Just get another one, put it in the crate. They come and they say, we found your dog, and they'll be coming up, they bring it up. She looks and says, that's not my dog. And they said, how do you know? She says, well, my dog's dead. I was taking it to bury it. Now, that's comedy. I want to talk to you about something called comedy, which you may not know about, but there's a reason I'm telling you. In the United States Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, Division 1, is called comedy, and it says, if a law of one state contradicts the law of another state, the government must follow the law of the original state. The reason I'm telling you this is I'm going to talk to you about the law. 
I don't practice in Colorado. I only practice in California. So what I tell you is California law. And in the laws of inheritance and wills and trust, pretty much the same until you get to Louisiana. Louisiana is based on French law. The rest of the country is based on English law. So there's basically two things that you can do to protect yourself and your estate and your animals. One's a will, the other's a trust. And since the question came up, I'm gonna go over to the AKC. I was the AKC judge for the West Coast. And I would go around and have these hearings and uh, people would put on their, uh, their argument and the AKC would have their attorney there and I would make a decision. I did that for about three years and when I ruled against the AKC, they disbanded the court. <laughs> and three years later, they started up a new court with a new judge. <laughs> but the point is, with the AKC, they will not follow what the papers say if you're a co-owner. If you want them to do anything until you call someone like me who threatens them from the law office, they won't do anything. So what you do if you're going to call them is very simple. Never call and another person or Bill or Sam. And it doesn't matter who dies. Because the AKC says, well, said or, so then that person's fine, or that person dies. It can be this person or, so that person owns it. The problem with and is the AKC says, well, the person who died only owned half the dog. So the person now that is the and person, they have to own half with the estate, and it gets terrible. Just use or. How do you use or? I mean, I just say co-owner owner and co-op. Yeah, it doesn't give you. Or, or after the first name. Okay. 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 Just write it in. Okay? It's really simple. So just say, write it in on our certificates? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, now that we can tell you something. Yeah. <laughs> Two things for an estate. A will and a trust. Let me tell you what they are. A will is a document that says, this is what I want to happen when I die. Now, how do you do a will? You can write it on a piece of paper. And if you write it in your handwriting and you sign it, that's called a holographic will. It'll be binding wherever you are. You write it in California, if you move to Maine, it's still valid. They may have to look at what the California law says, but you can write a holographic will. Second thing you can do is you can go to an attorney. I charge $150 to do a will. I charge that for 30 years. It takes me about an hour and a half. So it's a bargain. But there's nothing to them. As long as you say who you want to be the beneficiaries. And if it's a will prepared, it has to be signed by two witnesses. They don't have to see what the will says. They just say, this is who signed it. And if you want to be really explicit and you're not worried about it, and you're not a dog person, they have to say this person is of sound mind. Um, if you're a dog person, that might be a little <laughs> The second thing you can do is a trust. Now, I'm going to back up. A will is only a piece of paper, means nothing until you die. You write out a will, make sure you tear it up, you write another one, you tear it up, you write another one. If you don't have a will, all the states have something called intestate succession, meaning they don't have a will. So then what happens? Goes yeah. to your children first. You have no children, goes to your parents. Usually you don't have parents by that point. If you don't have parents, it goes to your brothers and sisters and so forth. All states have intestate succession. So unless you specifically want to do something, a will is meaningless and useless. Now the next thing is a trust. And a trust is a little different. A trust becomes effective when you write it and sign it. So you do a trust, and I like to refer it like a cigar box. And you can put things into that trust now. And you can record the trust now. And it can say, upon my death, this is what I want to happen. 
So a choice can be a little more satisfying and really get, make you feel more comfortable and you can always amend it unless you do an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable trust is usually the president, not currently, but the president will put all his holdings into an irrevocable trust for four years. At the end of four years, the trust is over and you can't do anything with it. One of the problems with a trust is people will form a trust to put their house in the trust. Well, now, if you want to sell the house, you have to get the permission of all the beneficiaries because the trust is existing. Okay. So generally what we do when we do a trust is we do what's called a pour over will. We don't put anything in the trust, but we have a will that says upon my death, everything goes into the trust. If you do that, you can avoid probate. You don't have to go to court for anything, except if you put real estate into the trust, you may have to go to probate just to change the title, because you've got to have a judge say, yes, it goes here. <coughs> With a trust, there's a bunch of other documents, uh, what they call a living will. Who gets to pull the plug if you're, 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 you're taking your last breath? I specifically said Teddy can't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the truth is, that one of the times when I was in the hospital, the hospital kept saying, you need a poor or a living trust, you need to say who's in charge, you need to tell us, and I said, no, I don't, it was the same truth hospital, I said, no, I don't care, and, you know, and they said, no, you have to, so I went back to the office, and I did an 18-page document, it said, you are to keep me alive no matter what. You are to use every heroic means you can find. If my eyeball is alive, you keep the rest of me, keep the eyeball alive, let the rest of me die. They didn't see the humor. <laughs> that, that's basically my attitude. No, if you do a trust, and you do other things like uh, a living will, a pour over will, uh, 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 you can do things like uh, name a, a person to, to handle your affairs, either your physical affairs or your uh, financial affairs. You can do all of these documents together, but the main thing is to determine who is going to be the beneficiary. And as Halley said, all states say the beneficiary is the most important part of a will or a trust. All the courts say it is our intent to live up to the wishes of the trustor or the person who did the will, and if they can determine what that is, they'll do it. I recently had a case where a man, older man, when he died, he left his wife the use of his house as long as she wanted to use it and said nothing else. So the brothers came along and said, well, you gotta get out, because we're gonna get the house when when you don't want it anymore anyway, so you got to get out. So we had to go to the court, we had to get the judge of the court to say, well, what he probably meant is she got the house, period. And actually there was no law on that. The judge went along with us, I was kind of surprised, but sometimes that happens. The main thing to remember is if you do a will, oh, also you can go to the, I don't think they have dime stores anymore, but you can go to the drugstore and get a will. You can go online and download a will. As long as you sign it and have two people that say this is the person who signed, it doesn't have to be notarized, just two people, and make sure they put their address on there if someone challenges. Now, you can challenge a will, people can challenge a trust. For about six years, I worked for the Watchtower, and my job was to go in, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses would go in when someone was dying and say, well, would you like to leave your estate to the Jehovah's Witnesses? And a lot of times they would. And then the family would come and say, well, eh, eh, it was undue influence. But I tried every one of those cases. I won every one of them because they would come in with a videotape and they'd say, now, are you sure you want to do this? And you know this isn't normal and you know you're cutting out your family. We won them. Every one of them went to court and we won them. And uh, I finally stopped because I couldn't put up with it anymore. But that, but I did that. So the main thing is remember, a will is a simple document. It doesn't say anything until you die. A trust is complicated because it starts, its effect is upon forming it. And you can record it with the county recorders. 
and then you can do a pour of a will and just leave your estate to the trust. And the nice thing about that is, remember, the will doesn't mean anything to you, die. so you can change it. You, you don't like your son anymore, you cut him out of the will, then he does something nice for you, you cut out your daughter, and then you, you cut out your son and your daughter, and until you decide to die, it doesn't mean anything. Any questions? Yes? Okay, um, my attorney gave me a Tillman Gleason revocable trust so that I can go in there and change, like if I buy a piece of property, I have to let her know I'm buying a piece of property and it has to be titled Helen Gleason revocable trust. And if I sell a piece of property, she has to send a copy to the uh, attorney there to let them know that I'm selling the property and then I always have to sign Helen Gleason, Helen Gleason Re or Helen Gleason revocable trust. Yes. You can do, you can name a trust anything. Yeah. I had a, a, a judge who didn't want her name to be recorded as to the ownership of her house. So I did the Lamont Cranston Revocable Trust. How many know who Lamont Cranston was? The shadow. The shadow. <laughs> so what you've done is you formed a trust, you put property <coughs> into the trust, you know who the beneficiary is, and a revocable trust, so you can always change it. I don't think I've done more than maybe three irrevocable trusts in 35 years, 40 years, 40, no, over 40 years. So yeah, as long as you can revoke it, you can change it. Yes. Okay. I'd say when I die, Vicki gets my dogs. Can no. I say? Vicki gets my dogs. When I die, Vicki gets my dogs. And when she dies, John gets my dogs. Can I do two sets? No. No, no, let's call it AB, an AB trust, or a remainder trust. What you can say is, I leave half of my estate to my husband and the other half to my kids from my first marriage after he dies. That's called an AB trust. <coughs> so you can do something, you can leave it to Vicki, but then it becomes Vicki. She can do anything she wants. So if you say, I leave it to Vicki, and when she dies, to John, no, because Vicki, and say, well, oh, no, I'm not leaving it to John, I'm leaving it to Teddy. <laughs> so, <laughs> <yeah>. Thanks. <laughs> 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 and say he had to leave it to someone. No, as soon as you it. leave it to your husband, okay. he can do anything he wants once you're dead. But then again, you're dead. What do you care? <laughs> <laughs> but you could do a contingency <laughs> that you leave it to, I leave my dogs to share, but in the event that she predeceases me, I leave them to Teddy. You can do that. Like that. Yeah. You can do it. I, I have no idea. No. Yeah. If someone predeceases. Okay. But once title passes, well, title, and I'm going to tell you something else about that. Once title passes, uh, that person then has the right to do what they want. Okay. Now, in California, they just changed the law about two years ago. Dogs have always been property like a chair or a table or a house. In California, they just declared that you can have visitation in a divorce with your dog. <laughs> and, you can, and so the courts are now awarding, okay, we're gonna give the dog to the wife, but the husband has alternate weekends, Friday evenings or Sunday evenings. Um, I, I've got mixed feelings about it, but it, where, what it is, it, it's the trend. The trend is gonna be that dogs are not property. That's, that's changed and that's where we're going. I don't know how many states have done that but California has. Any other questions? Just real quickly to, to add on to what she said. So as Evan said, you can do that with the, if this person predeceases, do this. Then be sure whatever financial stuff you're setting up to go with it, put the same contingency situation into play so that you make that follow down the so same path. So how do you feel is the best way if you're going to leave funds for the care of your dogs for a for whatever to that person is what is the best way to do that in your will and a trust and a either way is equally good but one of the things right. you want That's to do yeah. and i think yeah. Kelly would agree she's more of a financial planner than i am one of the things i would suggest is a trust fund with a distribution okay because if you leave someone two million dollars to care for your dog the dog's not going to live very long <laughs> <laughs> so what you're probably going to want to do to answer that question is like if you have a life insurance policies and there's lots of different kinds you can buy or a retirement account 
you want to designate that person as those beneficiaries. Those don't have to wait for the estate to the pay. Beneficiaries trump everything. Yes, they do. And if they're not, if you don't say I'm putting it into my will and trust, I mean you can list them in there, but they can pay way before they resolve out the estate. You wait the seven days or however long your estate takes to issue a death certificate. They have the death certificate to the company. They're writing you a check versus having to wait for the legal process to go forward on anything else. Yeah, so you really want that account to be delineated. A lot of people said, well, I'm just gonna leave it to my estate. I'm gonna put my beneficiary as my estate. I'm like, understand when you do that, it's dropping into all of this stuff and it's gonna wait till all that resolves. And as Evan said, if they didn't line out in there who it's supposed to be, now it goes to the state and they're deciding how to sort out, that can take forever. Whereas if you just put them on your insurance, life insurance policy as the beneficiary, and it pays out and it's done. And it's and the other thing too is that tax piece. Life insurance policies are tax free. Not all those other kinds of products necessarily are. Life insurance policies are really good tools for that. And there's a lot of ways you can do single premium whole life. You can do different things where it's like, so you wanna look at how you want it to pay and what the other consequences are. Because the other thing you don't wanna do is take somebody and hammer them with a giant tax bill. Yep. Now, if you use a 401k, or a retirement account with the beneficiary, they don't have to pay taxes on those funds, correct? Uh, no, they do. Okay. They do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Somebody's well, going to pay. Anything that has been tax deferred, been somebody's going to pay. So I'll tell you, one of the things you can do is term insurance, which is very cheap. It is cheap. And the beneficiary of your term insurance gets that money tax free. But at the same time, it'd be nice to set up a fund to distribute it. The other thing too with the term, the only kicker with term is making sure that that policy continues to be paid on because if you go into some kind of care and you stop paying the premium, they just go away and there's no cash value or anything attached to them. Whereas a whole life policy or like for instance, and again, can't dive into too much great detail, but like a single premium whole life, you put a premium payment in there one time. You never pay money on that ever again. It, may, it develops that value the day you put it in there and it's there for your lifetime and you never have to tap into it. And if you live a long time and it grows, it may be worth more than the face value. It just keeps growing and growing and it just sits there and you never touch it again and it's there forever. You want to be careful with whole life and 65 life. I used to sell life insurance for Northwestern Mutual and of course to meet my quota, we had a lot of life insurance. <laughs> and I was paying, I think something like $1,700 a month until I turned 75 when they wanted to change it to $3,600 a month. So I canceled it. Which is why, yeah, the 65 and the ones where you're paying them over time can get really expensive. That's why single premium can be nice. You can say, I want a this amount, base amount. They'll say, it'll cost you this much today. You never pay, you never touch it ever again. Can and you change the beneficiary on that? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. okay. And, and you can do an annuity that. too. You can do a one pay, single pay annuity. Mm -hmm. and you have that pay off at a certain term. I think it's, yeah, it's a very small oh, question, but a girlfriend of mine no lost small her husband, very tragic. And she is still hassling all her utility companies on and on and on because I don't know if her name wasn't on joint, but she goes through hours of hassle to prove that he's gone and certificates. Is there any way to avoid all that? Yeah. Get, get a friend who's an attorney and have them sign a letter from the law office. <coughs> they will back right off. Okay. These people will. Well, she's a dog. Per she's a shepherd person, and she's just gone. She's in a wheelchair. What and state? She, Arizona. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you know who it is. It's Naomi, and she's okay. just going through tell her torture. To, tell her to send me the policies and the letters. I'll Copies. send some. This isn't law. policies. It's like life yeah. bills and phone bills, and they're just. Hassle, hassle. Tell she has to give the death certificate. Send her, send her to me. Send in the information. Send it to Pardon? me. I'll get a letter out from the law. Well, she may have finished it by now, but okay. I know she went through. I think okay. that you free pay a, a, a term policy. So, for example, if I want to pay $5,000 for my dog to my son, I want to pay taxes, and I don't want to worry about it. Well, basically, you wouldn't want to prepay a term because. I mean, I guess you could prepay a term. It would just be, a, it would just say, you're predicting when you're gonna die. So if your crystal ball is telling you when that's gonna happen, I'd say, I just want a 10 year term policy and here's my premium money, you're good to go, but in 10 years, it's gonna go away. Where the single premium whole life, you could, if you live to be 120, it just keeps going. All right, the life insurance policies is a company I've worked for. Lastly, you're 121. So good for you if you make it there, you're probably gonna make a lot of extra money off that. People are gonna be really impressed with you. 
so it isn't gonna matter, but at that point in time, and that's what's nice about those. You go in and you pay one premium and you never pay again. You know that person, you know exactly how much money they're gonna get, at least at a minimum, because if you live a long time, it grows. And you can change it. They're not as expensive as like what Evan's talking about with the whole life you pay over time. Because you're paying, basically what you're doing is you're buying it now and expensive. right and it's just kind of it's going to grow so much over time they're just assuming you live for a while so it grows and they, they calculate it out they're not cheap they're not cheap like a term policy is but term policies are exactly for that reason they yeah, are it's almost like a lot. growing cash yeah well, it's kind of almost like an annuity would do yeah. for you every life insurance is two things two parts it's the annuity and the death benefit okay. so the more that's annuity the more expensive it is, the less that there is annuity and death benefit. So you can buy, as Hallie said, you can just buy a death benefit, which is a single payer death benefit, that's less expensive. Of course, it depends on when you're going to die. I don't think for any of us, we're, we're all going to die young, that's gone. <laughs> kind of hey, that <laughs> well, and yeah. So, would it be better to buy, like, okay, so you want to take care of your dogs, um, I will, oh, okay, my st stuff would go to my son if my husband was gone too. But my friends would get my dogs when they figured, when they find out about this. <laughs> but so would it be better to do like two smaller life things or do it as one and have to like divvy it out? I think it depends on the situation. I mean, that's what Hallie does. She finds she herself. And you can patients. name as many beneficiaries as want and split percentage wise. So yeah. you could okay. say, I want to give 40% to my children. I want to give 30% to the person who's taking my dogs. Okay. And I want to take 30% to who, I mean, you can divvy it up however you want. Okay. And you can change it, right, and final expenses or whatever. Yeah. You can divvy it up however you want. Yeah. Okay, including charities? Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I was told... By the way, when Pearl died, she just died recently, when Pearl did her will, she wanted me to get, have concerns of my state go to PETA. And that's what I said to her. And she changed her mind. Okay, yeah. I was told that if I buy, a, let's say, a $500,000 term policy for my children, I die, that money automatically goes into my estate. <coughs> However, if my children are paying the premiums on that term policy, the money then avoids my estate and goes directly to the children. No, if you name your themselves. children as your beneficiaries, it does not go to your estate. It goes directly to no, your children. No matter what you're doing, you you what you're doing is you're talking about buying policies and making your estate or your trust the beneficiary. Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. Just name the person you want okay. to go to. It goes tax free. Okay. Anytime in any of your financial stuff where you can directly name a beneficiary and skip your estate, it's a good way to go. It's faster, it's simpler, and it avoids because like if you name your, your estate on a life insurance policy and it goes into your estate, guess what happens when it goes out to your beneficiaries? Yeah, it has to go through the whole Yep. A little different subject. I never had to do this, but if I need to remove a co-owner off an AKC registration because of death, it's very hard for the AKC to do it, but they do. We just with did a, one for with Kathy. a death certificate. Yes. yes, we just did it for Kathy, and uh, it was very difficult. And I had to get involved, and I had to make some threats. But with a death certificate, the AKC will take that person's name off. Okay. But you're better off starting with or. Then you don't have to worry about it. No, I'm going to go home and write or on every one of my sisters. Oh, by the way, by the way, if it's already written, write or and have the other person initial it. Yeah, yeah. I bet they would. <laughs> well, especially if you tell them that's the only way we're going to do this thing. No. Anything else that can help? Wow. Okay. How do you come up with, a, do you, if your dog is six, do you come up with a, an amount? On an average life expectancy. Well, the problem is, are what you're doing with that dog? It's challenging. The problem is, you don't know. You don't know is that dog going to die at eight? Is it going to die at twelve? 
I would, I would tell you from what I've done with the people I've planned that portion for, it becomes more about the relationship with the person who's taking the dog and what you feel like they need to do all of that stuff for you than really about coming up with the amount for the dog. And then you can kind of divvy that out. Um, people are all over the board. They're all over the board. I mean, I have some people who leave 500 bucks. Okay, that's not a lot, but okay. And then I have some people who leave $10,000 a year, yeah. you know, and, and some people who just throw a chunk of change at. So it really kind of depends on how you feel about that oh, and that how thing? important those like, relationships are. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think we're going to have to yeah. wrap it because the event is coming This has been fascinating. Up. Thank you. So wow. Much. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them for you offline, too. If what? you just ha want to ask me something yeah. specific, I'll tell you I was just going to beg Heaven and Hallie to please provide their information on that yeah. question, yeah. if they don't mind. Oh, yeah. You can have my number. Number two, uh, I I would say in this on the ring, I've represented 25 percent of the people here in the show on one thing or another. So call me, the number is 714. I'm on there too, just under set work. Go ahead, Evan. 714. Three six three six. Are you mine is, oh, yes. mine is two zero eight eight six six five 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 nine. And this is being recorded. It will be put on the German Shepherd Dog Club of America website. Cool. So you can revisit this and get information you may. We have Dr. Gregory Burns is going to give a reproduction um, presentation in just a few minutes. So we need to get him set up and start it over here. I want to add one more thing. You call me. I'm working half days now. Six in the morning and six at night. <laughs> um, there are seven days in the month, so feel free to go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.